This is your call to discipleship, brought to you by Pastor Gary Cavenda, a senior pastor of Biran Bible Ministries, which meet at Stephen North Pigeon Hall at Sunfield Place, off Broadway, also known as Swapper Road. Here is Pastor Gary. This message was part of a four-part series of interviews recorded with James Jacob Prash back in June 2008. Greetings in the precious name of Jesus our Savior. I have with me today James Jacob Prash, Bible teacher, evangelist, and author. Jacob, welcome. Wonderful to be with you. Praise the Lord. Can you please tell us a bit about yourself before we go on? Yes. Uh, my name is uh, James Jacob Prash. I'm a Christian author. I, uh, from a science background, but then I switched to theology after the Lord called me into the ministry. Here in South Africa, I uh, direct the International Memorial Ministries, but we have a branch in South Africa which operates uh, homes for uh, AIDS orphan babies, and we have churches affiliated with our ministry in uh, Port Elizabeth and in the suburbs of Johannesburg. Uh, we operate in several countries, but South Africa is, of course, one of them, and I visit South Africa periodically. We have a number of people here on our mail list and who attend our conferences and our meetings, and it's always a pleasure to be with you. Thank you, Jacob. Jacob, we want to focus today on the subject of eschatology, which has really been stirring in our Christian community. You know, eschatology really speaks about the study of the last things, and I think the most significant event in eschatology has been the coming of our Lord Jesus again. And o over the years, evangelicals have agreed on a number of things, and but there's also things in which evangelicals disagree. And uh, I think the disagreement has to do largely with what happens before Jesus comes and what happens after he comes. Now, there are major questions um, concerning eschatology and many major differences. I think the fundamental differences has to do with the way evangelicals interpret scripture. And uh, so, as a Bible teacher, what would you say are the best procedures to be followed in reading and interpreting the scripture so as to ensure that one lays hold of a reasonable or true understanding of the scripture? Uh, in this, I'd like you to address just the general basics about the study of the last things. And I think the most training, how should he or she read the scripture? First of all, we have to define the term you use, evangelical. It doesn't mean in popular usage what it meant 20 years ago. And in fact, at different times of history, it's meant different things. During the Reformation, evangelical designated a Lutheran from a Calvinist. Uh, up until about 10, 15 years ago, it would have meant a born-again Christian as opposed to a nominal Protestant. Now we have people in all shapes and sizes claiming to be evangelical, but many are not biblically evangelical in the traditional sense. And interpreting the scripture so as to ensure that one lays... Born again, if you mean Bible-believing, if you mean that definition of evangelical, well, we can talk to those kind of people. Bear in mind today, there are many people following things like the purpose-driven agenda, the ecumenical agenda, the interfaith agenda, who are defining themselves as evangelical, but they would not have the same view of scripture or regeneration or salvation through Christ alone that others who would traditionally claim to be evangelical would have. So first of all, we have to understand what we mean by evangelical. If we said Bible-believing Christians who are regenerate, who have been saved by Jesus in, in terms of a personal faith and regeneration and sanctification of the Holy Spirit, we can agree on that kind of evangelical. But there may be others listening to this who would see evangelical by some other definition. Concerning the Bible itself, for those who are not formally trained in academic theology, who do not read Greek, Hebrew, or may not even be able to read English very well, what is the basic approach? Well, first of all, begin with the premise, it is the inspired word of God. Let's understand the nature of the Bible. <clears throat> Jesus is fully human and fully divine. He's not half God and half man. He is totally God and totally man. Yet he himself is the word. The Greek term is logos, the Hebrew term is dvar, and the Aramaic term is mamra. It is Jesus. He is the word made flesh. We might say, spiritually, the Bible, the Old and New Testament, is Jesus in published form. Jesus in published form. If you want to know what God is like, look at Jesus. If you want to know what Jesus is like, read the scriptures. Understand you're not just reading a book. You're having an encounter with the person by the Holy Spirit. You're having an encounter with the person by the Holy Spirit. Now, if somebody is not truly born again, if somebody is not truly saved, that encounter is not going to happen. It's just like reading any other book. You're only going to see it as a human book, a human element. You're not going to see it as the word of God in the word of man. 
it's going to be what Matthew wrote or what Isaiah wrote or what Paul wrote alone. You're not going to see or hear Jesus in it and through it. You're only going to see the human element. You're not going to see the divine element unless you're truly born again and have the Spirit of God. An unsaved person will not be able to understand the scriptures as a spiritual book. They will not have Holy Spirit revelation until they come to faith in Jesus. The most that can happen is God can quicken them, convict them of their sin, and draw them to the way of salvation through reading the scripture, and then God can open their eyes to it. But people who are not born again are blind. So if somebody is not even born again, there's no point in trying to understand the Bible spiritually or theologically in a sense of revelation. To them, it'll only be history and literature. That's all it will be, is history and literature at best. There'll be no spiritual revelation in it. The theology will simply be the study of history and literature at best. It will not be a divine revelation coming through the history and literature. There'll be no real encounter with Christ. The most important thing in reading the scripture is an encounter with Christ. However, it must still be accepted that in addition to a spiritual book, it is history and literature, and it has to be read that way. You cannot simply distort it out of context to make the text say what you want it to be. Let's go back to the baby. When somebody is first saved, all they see is the light. They begin to get the definition. It's the same with the scripture. You begin to understand basic things, but eventually you begin to get more definition. The New Testament draws a distinction between milk and meat. It does this in 1 Corinthians, and it does this in the epistle to the Hebrews, milk and meat. New believers need milk. Old believers need meat. One of the main problems you have here in South Africa generally, and that you have here in the northern areas of KwaZulu-Natal, north of Durban, is you have people who've been saved five, ten years and more, sometimes even pastors, that have never had anything but milk. If a baby has not been weaned, meat is dangerous. They can choke on it. There are people who do not know the fundamental principles of interpreting the scripture correctly, what we call hermeneutics, who are trying to digest things that require significant amount of dairy diet before you can take this solid diet. If you don't know basic doctrine, if you do not understand the gospel correctly and perfectly, if you don't understand regeneration, if you don't understand the person of Christ, if you don't understand the ministry of the Holy Spirit, if you don't understand baptism, if you don't understand the basis of fellowship, if you don't understand the need to evangelize and how to go about doing it, if you don't understand the importance of discipleship, if you don't understand the basic ideas of the church, what we call ecclesiology, if you don't understand those basic things, it is futile trying to understand the book of Revelation, the book of Daniel, the book of Ezekiel. Um, milk is for babies, meat is for the mature. But we're warned about something in Hebrews chapter 5, discerning the word of righteousness, looking at the baby once again. A baby thinks it can eat anything. Once it becomes a toddler and begins to crawl around, the mother has to take anything that the baby can reach and put it where the baby can't reach it because they will try to eat it. They'll swallow anything. Um, they've not been weaned yet. They will not know what's edible from what's inedible. They can eat a poison. They can eat something that can make them choke. Well, a believer is the same thing. They go around and they hear different doctrines, they taste different doctrines, they could be taking poison into themselves. There are cases where people who have been actually born again, actually been saved, had a Jehovah's Witness or a Mormon come to the door and, and, and sent by Satan as a sheep napper to, to get them, and because they, their senses were never trained, they didn't know this is not biblical, this is not Christian. Always begin with the milk, but understand if you have nothing but milk, you become a sitting duck, an easy target for spiritual deception because your senses will not know how to discern good from evil, we are told. It is important to wean believers from the milk onto the meat. Now, the way Hebrews does this is the writer of Hebrews says, I want to tell you about Melchizedek, the typology of Melchizedek, but I can't do that. You people don't quite understand basic things like baptism and the laying on of hands anymore. How can I tell you about Old Testament typology fulfilled in Christ when you don't know basic doctrine? 
A fundamental problem today is people don't know basic doctrine, but they're like the baby crawling around on the rug, putting anything in its mouth. A coin, a pencil, a crayon, a button, a stone, anything that fits in their mouth, the baby will put in their mouth because they don't know any better. They've never been weaned. Their senses have not been trained to discern good from evil. There are a lot of Christians who don't know basic doctrine anymore, trying to take on heavier doctrine until they learn the basic one. So you've got two problems. You're giving meat to babies, but the only reason they're babies is because they haven't been weaned off the milk to begin with. This is the first problem you have to understand. Much of the confusion taking place in KwaZulu-Natal and elsewhere now is because of this very reason. People were never properly taught basic doctrine. They were never given enough milk when they were babes in Christ. They were never properly weaned. And so now they're going around tasting this, tasting that, tasting the other thing. They're getting into the latter-day reign, the apostolic transformation. They're getting into preterism. But they don't know what to eat, what not to eat. They don't know what's edible and what isn't because they never had a good basic diet. How would a Christian, you say, come to an understanding of basic... I think where I'm coming to here is... How would someone who's been trained in the scripture, who's understood baptism, who've understood regeneration, okay. why would they now suddenly go and believe latter rain theology? What, what would they recognize as fundamentally wrong in the way latter rain theology interprets scripture? I think that's the basis I want to develop. Okay, here. so we have to understand something. Don't try to teach meat. Don't feed meat to babies. Don't try to teach the book of Revelation to young believers. On the other hand, don't have older believers continually drinking milk. They've got to move beyond that. How do you move beyond that? Well, let's understand something that Paul and Peter tells us. Peter was a fisherman. He was an apostle, but he was a fisherman. Writing about deeper issues of Scripture, Peter writes, let Paul explain these things. <laughs> you had people like Apollos and Paul who were better geared from their human background to explain deeper things. Peter was an apostle. He had the same apostolic authority in the New Testament sense of the word as Peter and as, as, as Paul and Apollos did. In fact, Paul was the least of the apostles. But Peter was humble enough to say, let Paul explain the complicated things. Most of the crackpots and deceivers who are teaching rubbish today were people who are uneducated. They were people like William Branham, mindless babblers, people who didn't really know what they were talking about. They were too arrogant to say, let somebody who'd been to seminary teach these things. Now understand this idea of seminary and theological education. Having a formal theological education does not in itself equip somebody to be a Bible teacher. There are people in faculties of divinity in the most leading and prestigious universities in the world who are not even born again. They're liberal theologians, they're higher critics. However, Jesus said when a scribe, the theologians of his day were the Sophrim, the scribes, Jesus said when a scribe becomes a disciple, he brings out of the treasury things old and things new. If somebody does not know Greek and Hebrew, if somebody does not have a background in academic theology, they are not in a position to bring things out of the treasury old and new. That's not to say they don't have a ministry. It's not to say that God doesn't bless them or that God doesn't use them. God did bless and use Peter. Peter did preach. Many were saved. Peter did disciple. Peter did shepherd. Peter did pastor. But he left heavier batteries of eschatology and other issues theologically, to Paul, he said so himself. The first thing you should look at is, does this person even know what they're talking about? <laughs> can they read Greek and Hebrew? Now, the fact that they can doesn't mean that they're having revelation from the Holy Spirit. But the fact that they can't pretty well indicates that they're a crackpot. Uh, the first question. What are the four ways in which evangelicals interpret prophecy in Scripture, and what approach do you apply in understanding prophecy? Okay, we have to understand something. 
evangelicals in the sense of Bible-believing born-again Christians, um, and again, it's a broad term today. There are people who are calling themselves evangelicals, which others would say are not evangelicals. It depends on how you define evangelical. But let's assume you mean born-again, Bible-believing Christians who have been saved, who had a personal salvation experience, and who believe in the doctrinal authority of, 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 of Scripture as the Word of God. The four ways evangelicals interpret it are basically called preterism, historicism, poemicism, and futurism. But let's go back to the beginning. The church is predominantly Gentile. After the apostles were no longer here, we're going into the 2nd, 3rd, 4th, 5th century, you had a Hellenization of the church. The church was initially Judaic, not Hebraic. It was theologically and spiritually, and to a large degree culturally, a Jewish institution. The New Testament was written by Jewish authors, the only exception being Luke, a Syrophoenician convert to Judaism. They had a Judaic perspective of the scriptures. The church fathers, the patristic writers, Hellenized the church, and Hellenistic or Greek philosophical concepts of interpretation began to come in. What I would do is emphasize the original Judeo-Christian hermeneutics of the first century church that we see in the writings of the apostles. I would not emphasize the patristic methods of the church fathers that are influenced by everything from Platonism to Aristotelianism to even Gnosticism. I would not emphasize that. In the early Gentile church, you had two predominant schools of hermeneutics and their approach to interpreting the Bible. The Alexandrian school, which had strong Gnostic influences that took a mystical approach to the Word of God, and you had the Antiochian school, which was better in that it took a more literal approach, the Antiochian fathers. But I would even put all of that Gentile Christendom aside and go back to the New Testament, to the Jewish authors of the New Testament itself. A Jewish believer in the first century, reading the writings of the apostles and the words of Jesus, he would not think in terms of preterism, poemicism, futurism, or historicism. He would not think in those terms. Today, in a theological seminary or Bible college, you'd be taught there are four approaches. A preterist is somebody who says it already happened. There are two kinds of preterists and two kinds of preterism. There's the kind of preterism that most evangelicals would agree is heretical. This is the kind of preterism used by theological liberals. They would say, for instance, well, obviously Isaiah could not have known that a king was going to be born 200 years later named Cyrus, who was going to restore the Jews to Jerusalem. Therefore, there's a Deutero-Isaiah. Isaiah did not write the book of Isaiah. We can't be sure there's a God, and if there is, he doesn't know the future, and if he did, he certainly didn't tell Isaiah. Therefore, the prophecies in Isaiah about King Cyrus are an ex China interpolation. They were written hundreds of years later after the prophecy was already fulfilled and written back into the Bible to make it seem like a prediction. It's an ex vaticina interpolation. That's a kind of preterism used by liberal higher critics. Okay, they would say the book of Daniel is too accurate. Therefore, obviously, Daniel didn't write it. Somebody wrote it in the Hasmonean period after the Maccabees and, and signed Daniel's name to it. It's a, it's a forgery. It's something that somebody wrote to make it look like a prediction when it wasn't. That's one kind of preterism. Generally speaking, we are not talking about that kind of pre preterism. That kind of preterism is consigned to liberal higher critics who don't accept the divine inspiration of Scripture. Among people who say they're evangelicals, we have the other kind of preterism. These things already happened in the early church and have no future meaning. Matthew 24, the Olivet Discourse was fulfilled. The book of Revelation happened. These things all transpired in the events surrounding 70 AD and leading up to it. Um, that's one kind of preterism. Then there is the historicists. The historicists say, well, these things did happen in the early church, but they're ongoing and dynamic. They have 
an ongoing historical sense of fulfillment. The Protestant reformers classically were by and large of the historicist persuasion. They would say there's an ongoing historical dynamic being fulfilled without history. Since the papacy is an antichrist institution, since the Pope claims to be the vicar of Christ, the Cadius Christos, which translated into Greek would be Antichristos, Antichrist, the Pope is the Antichrist. That was the thinking of the reformers. Um, not just that he is an Antichrist, but they would say he is the Antichrist, some of them. This is historicism. And they look for all kinds of events that have transpired throughout history, mainly European history, that they would see as the ongoing fulfillment of, of, of New Testament apocalyptic eschatology. Then you have the poemicists. The poemicist approach is often favored by people of a Lutheran persuasion. Here the term evangelical becomes complicated because uh, during the Reformation, evangelical simply separated a Lutheran Protestant from a Reformed Calvinistic Protestant. <laughs> it didn't mean then, what it, in the 16th century, what it means now. And of course, even now, it doesn't mean what it did 25, 30 years ago. 25, 30 years ago, it meant a born-again Christian who believed the Bible. Now evangelical is a broad term. You have people into the purpose-driven agenda, the ecumenical movement, and so forth, who claim to be evangelical, but they would not be biblically evangelical, from the Greek word evangelion. So the reformers took this historicist approach. Then uh, you had the poemicist favored by other people coming from a more Lutheran tradition. Poemicism says, it's the word of God, but don't take it as any kind of literal prediction of any event. It's simply poetry to encourage the church during difficult times, times of persecution, that Christ is going to one day return. There will be a parousia. Jesus will come back one day. This world will end. It's simply poetry to remind us of heaven, our eternal destiny, and to encourage us through our sojourning in the difficult times of this life about things eternal. That is the approach of the poemicist. Finally, there are the futurists. The futurists are the classical Howlinsey type, like Red Planet Earth people, or the New late New Zealand evangelist Barry Smith, people who will see a future prophetic eschatological meaning for these things. The foremost futurist at the moment is, of course, Tim LaHaye and his immensely successful Left Behind series uh, in terms of popular authorship. So these are the four approaches. If you go to a theological seminary, they're either going to teach one of these four, or they're going to teach all four and say, make up your own mind. Are you a preterist? Are you a historicist? Are you a poemicist? Or are you a futurist? That is the way the Gentile church looks at it. Now I go back to the way the first century Jewish church would have looked at it. Let's begin with the New Testament, not with church history, not with patristic theology, not with Reformed theology, not with Protestant theology, not with Latter-day Latter theology. Let's go back and look at the Judeo-Christian New Testament, written by Jewish believers in the first century, often two Jewish believers. Let's go back and understand how the New Testament would look at these, these issues. Jesus took the issue of the abomination of desolations. An Aramaic term, Hashikut Sameshomen, from the book of Daniel. This already had a historical fulfillment with Antiochus Epiphanes, 160 years or so earlier, in the pre-Hasmonean period, at the time of the Maccabees. It already happened, and Jesus knew it happened, because Jesus in John chapter 10 celebrated Hanukkah the Jewish Feast of Hanukkah, which the New, which the New Testament in English calls the uh, Feast of Dedication of the Temple. So Jesus knew that this already happened, that Antiochus came and he set up an image of Zeus, the Greek god Zeus, which is a corruption of Theos, the word for God in Greek. They identified with the planet Jupiter and he set up the image of Zeus, giving Zeus his own fa facial features. Okay? That would be the fact that it already happened. Now Jesus makes a prediction of it. He says, when you see that happening, well, why did he do that? Why did he take something that already was fulfilled and say it's going to happen again? Jesus used preterism 
but he did not use preterism in the way that John Bray does, or David Shulton does, or Rasmus Rashduni does. He takes a prophecy that already happened and says it has a future meaning. Okay? But then, this abomination of desolations. When the temple was destroyed in 70 AD, Josephus records how the Romans set up pagan ensigns on the Temple Mount where the Holy of Holies had been and worshipped it. That was an abomination. The Emperor Hadrian leveled the Temple Mount and he put uh, the Temple of Jupiter, Avelina Capitolina, on the Temple Mount. That was an abomination. Then we get to the 4th century, Constantine's nephew, Julian the Apostate, puts an abomination. He tries to rebuild the temple to reverse the prophecy of Jesus that the stones will be thrown down upon another. He tries to repaganize the Roman Empire and reverse Jesus' prophecy. All these mysterious fires happen. That was an abomination. Today in the Temple Mount, you have the Mosque of Omar, the Dome of the Rock, with a quotation from a surah in the Quran, God has no son, he's not begotten, neither does he beget. Well, we're told in 1 John, if you deny the father-son relationship, this is Antichrist. There's an abomination on there now. Historicism is true. There's multiple ongoing fulfillments. But then John wrote Revelation during the persecution of the emperor Domitian, most certainly at the end of the first century. It was poetry to encourage the church at the time of persecution. Hence, polemicism is true. But Jesus said, when you see this happening, it's going to happen again. Futurism is true. There are events predicted in Revelation and in Matthew 24 that have no historical fulfillment, that you must engage in Gnosticism, mysticism, and every kind of acrobatics to try to make it pretend it happened. Jesus himself said, the great tribulation, of of Jeremiah, is going to be a time that nothing that bad has ever happened before and nothing worse will happen after it. Far worse things have happened to the Jews and to the church since 70 AD, as bad as it was. Worse things have happened to the Jews in the second century, to the church in the second century, to the church in the Middle Ages. Far worse things have happened both to the Jews and the church. This radical preterism that it all happened then is complete nonsense. It is total idiocy to pretend it could possibly have no future meaning because it would make Jesus a liar. One of two things are true. Either Jesus is a liar or David Chilton is a moron. I think David Chilton is a moron. It's not one of the four. It's all four. Prophecy is pattern. The same events are recapitulated. There's multiple abominations of desolations, but they foreshadow the final, ultimate one. It's not which of these four is true. It's all four are simultaneously true. That is how the early Jewish Christians would have understood prophecy. As pattern, not as prediction and fulfillment, but as a pattern with an ultimate fulfillment. Each minor fulfillment is a foreshadowing of the final one. Thank you, Jacob. This message was part of a four-part series of interviews recorded with James Jacob Prash back in June 2008. This program, A Call to Discipleship, was brought to you by Pastor Kerry Gavenda, a senior pastor of Berean Bible Ministries in Deben North. For prayer and counseling, please call 084-3539-563 or you can email Kerry Gavenda at gmail.com and don't forget to spell Kerry with a double R. Thank you for listening. Bye.